And so uh, here in a minute we're going to talk about Aleister Crowley and uh, what he is believed to have done up on top of Shaw Mountain along with a guy named H.P. Lovecraft. And, and these two guys were uh, just mad scientists. Like, that's the best way I can describe them. If you don't know who Crowley is and H.P. Lovecraft, definitely check them out because they're definitely interesting. H.P. Lovecraft was a writer who talked about uh, portals and he wanted, he wrote about these portals that would open and these beasts would come out. And uh, Crowley's dream was to uh, open portals and let creatures come out. And some say he achieved that dream. And uh, again, we'll talk about that in a second because that really interests me because at the end of the day, he may have actually done just that. But uh, here in this site, um, it's really <coughs> interesting. Again, our psychic felt like this was an area that may hold a portal. And people say that portals will let things come in and out from like another dimension or uh, it'll let ghosts come through. And our psychic believed that there was a portal here and she thought she actually made contact with Betty Hill. And what you're about to see is the moment where she truly makes contact with, with what she says is Betty Hill. As long as it works. Yeah, there you go. And communicate through dowsing rods. And uh, dowsing rods are, are pretty cool. Uh, my cousin, uh, he lives here, he's Bert Grimm, he has Grimm's Groundsworks. He said he literally uses those to this day to find water. A lot of people do that. There's people that say that they can use it to find a quarter on the ground. So there's something to dowsing rods. I don't understand it yet, but she was able to use these dowsing rods and truly communicate uh, with Betty Hill. It was really an incredible moment to see that happen. So for me, I live in like the scientific world. I don't want to believe portals are real. So like I dove into the scientific side of this stuff and I wanted to learn more about really what is a portal. And, and so um, what else do you do? You know, Wikipedia, right? Like, you know, what is this? So you go to Wikipedia and it basically says that it's just, uh, I don't know what you see here, uh, basically a gate or a door uh, at the end of a tunnel or the magical technology doorways that connect two locations, dimensions, or points in time. But, you know, they say that's fiction. That's not real, right? According to Wikipedia. So uh, what does science say, right? Basically, the only way a portal can exist is, bam, through a wormhole. And wouldn't that be cool to actually see one of those? It's pretty rad. And so uh, what a wormhole is, is a, uh, a fold in the space-time continuum, and it creates a shorter distance between two points and allows things to travel great distance uh, with just minimal effort or minimal time. So uh, that's really what a dimensional portal is, exactly what you see right there. So to, to understand a wormhole, you need to look at Einstein and his theories. Einstein is awesome. So if you ever get a chance, read everything you can about this guy because he was way before his time. Every one of his theories are still holding up to this day. And uh, this guy, he was an absolute genius, absolute genius. So uh, his theories um, really were about general relativity and special relativity. That's just two of his theories. And really these were based on um, why everyone sees light at the same speed. So what, they, what he's trying to say is all of us really perceive everything in the same way. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of like general relativity, special relativity. So back in the day, there was this guy named Isaac Newton. You guys probably heard of him. He was the cat that sat underneath the tree and the apple fell on his head and said, whoa, man, we got gravity. So, but that didn't exactly happen that way. He uh, was truly like watching apples fall from the tree. And he just wondered why these apples didn't go shoot off that way or you know crooked or whatever and he was like well the earth does this you know the earth is is the center of gravity it just draws everything towards it and he was kind of right but not exactly um there's a lot of other uh important things you have to think about when it comes to gravity and, and all this kind of weird stuff um and the biggest problem with newton's theory and look kind of creepy didn't he like isaac newton was definitely a creepy looking dude Look at that nose, it's worse than mine, it's pretty sad. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, through all this creepiness, he was pretty cool, he's smart. But uh, the problem with this is basically, it just doesn't hold true. You know, it just doesn't hold true when you start looking at uh, moving objects and the bend in time and space, and it just doesn't hold true that things always move in a straight line because they just don't. Like if I stood right here with an apple and spun like this and let it go, it would go that way, it wouldn't go straight down. So uh, 
Einstein knew that, and so Einstein designed this really crazy equation to uh, really basically explain all that stuff. And so there's Einstein just getting a kick out of everything. He's like, yeah, I just figured this out. So, uh, so yeah, he just proved that uh, Newton's theory didn't hold up, and it really wasn't that hard. You know, he could just spin around, let something go, and be like, yeah, that just, that's just not right. So uh, speed is the biggest problem with uh, Newton's theory, like I was saying. And I love this little clip. I actually stole it from the Internet because I think it does such a great job of explaining uh, the theory. So check it out. Like, if you're in a train... running at two mile an hour and you throw something seven or five mile an hour it's actually moving seven mile an hour but someone looking at you uh, has a whole different perception of what's going on so um yeah i think that's a really interesting way to look at things you know like everyone has a different perspective of what's going on uh and everybody just sees it a little bit differently it's kind of neat but yeah, yeah, it's a good representation of space and time. So mass and acceleration both cause curves in the space-time continuum, or space-time, or whatever you want to call it. And so, uh, so you can see that. You can see how like the Earth would change uh, the gravitational pull around it, which is really weird. So this is uh, Einstein's equation. Isn't that crazy? Like, who would even know how to figure? I don't even know what that means. Like, that's just a complete different language to me. But anyway, this is his equation that is supposed to solve every answer in the universe that has to do with, like, uh, space and time. And some dude, some super ridiculous smart guy, uh, Carl Schwarzschild, I guess that's how you pronounce his name, was uh, the first one to break this crazy thing down, and uh, it ended up, uh, the solution was a black hole. I mean, at the end of the day, this guy right here, um, while, while like fighting in the trenches during World War World War One, I, I put two, but it was actually World War One. Uh, he was actually fighting in the trenches, and he actually figured this thing out while fighting. And then uh, Einstein was blown away by it. He actually uh, presented this guy's findings at the academy. He didn't really say what academy, but uh, he was really excited that someone actually took his equation and figured it out and found out black holes are real. Well, at least mathematically possible. And then so later on, we actually figured out black holes are real. And we can do that based on their effects to the surrounding planets and, and whatnot around them. So we do know black holes are real. So wormholes. Wormholes are definitely the other solution to that equation that we looked at a minute ago. And that is what has to happen. That right there has to happen in order for a portal to actually be real. And it requires so much power and so much energy to create that portal that literally planets would implode. Like, that's the truth. Like, that takes that much power for a portal to open. Planets blow up. It's just crazy. So um, recently, uh, there has been some breakthroughs about this, portals. And so they were able to um, actually create one. They took and created a portal. Uh, they did it with magnetic energy rather than gravitational energy. We've been learning about gravitational energy, and the important thing is there's a difference. Um, a magnetic portal can be created by separating the north and south poles of a magnet, and then it literally creates a portal in between. And they don't understand how or why it does it, but it's actually visible to the naked eye, but it's not visible to any kind of instruments out there. They just can't see it with any instrument, but you can see it with your naked eye, and you know that 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 portal is going on which is really strange again it's just uh kind of mind-blowing yes they can't get photos you can't find them it's a true portal it, it twists it does exactly what a portal does um but they don't understand why or even like uh yeah they just don't get it um but they have actually been able to make them invisible and that's intriguing to me because if all right, so NASA recently put out this whole thing where, like, portals are real, right? So they, they say portals are real, and they happen with massive amounts of magnetic fields cross, and it creates a portal, and they can actually see energy moving in and out of these portals. That's a fact. You can look that up on Google. And so um, they took that information and created this wormhole in the laboratory and did it. I mean, it's, it's legit. They created a wormhole. Uh, but again, it's a different type of wormhole. It's a magnetic, ma magnetic wormhole opposed to a gravitational wormhole because we're really good at manipulating uh, electricity and magnetic, magnetic waves. But we have no idea 
how gravity works. It's based on mass. You know, the, the more dense something is, the more gravitational pull it has. So uh, we don't know how to really create gravity, but we know how to create magnetic fields. So anyway, uh, with NASA's information of these portals being real, these people uh, actually creating one in a lab, and this freaking thing from a scientific American kind of blew me away. You know, they say that this wormhole was created in a lab, and the device acts like uh, the device acts like a wormhole, as if the magnetic field was transferred to an extra special dimension. So it's almost like we're able to create these extra dimensions or, or almost like a portal into them, but we haven't figured out how to use them yet. So it's really getting kind of mind blowing because the science behind all this, the, the math behind it says that these wormholes are not possible, but we're actually able to create them. And, and that's kind of mind blowing to me because uh, that means that for me, that means that they could exist on a larger scale. They could exist on a scale large enough to let something in. And I don't know exactly how all that works, but uh, this is a magnetic field. This kind of gives you an idea of what they were working with. So basically they split this magnetic field and when they did, all these little strings and stuff went to the center and created that magnetic field that she asked about. So um, yeah, they separated the poles and created this monopole and it's definitely not found in nature. So what does this mean for the paranormal encrypted researcher people? Well, it means the science doesn't know everything, at least not yet. And definitely people say they can open portals. We talked a little bit about this guy yesterday. He looks kind of sketchy, huh? Yeah, I wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley. It'd be a little weird. But this is Aleister Crowley. Uh, people say he's the most evil man on earth. I think he was, uh, I think he was a showman. I think at the end of the day, this guy was like the, the old school Barnum and Bailey kind of dude. He, he, was, he knew how to entertain, uh, but he also was very skilled at magical stuff. <laughs> Um, he was definitely one of those guys that uh, was influential uh, just about everywhere, even to this day. I mean, he's, he's had his fingers everywhere. I mean, this guy uh, was everywhere, and, and he believed that he could open up portals. So while living in New York City, Crowley said that he performed some magical experiments. Uh, what he did, it's funny, I didn't check my writing. But what he did was uh, called the amolith, I can't pronounce it, working. So what he did was ended up... Uh, it was a theory that was created deliberate, I don't know, basically, to make a long story short, it opened up a portal and uh, let this guy right here in. So this is Lamb. Uh, this was drawn by uh, Aleister Crowley. He said that he was in New York, opened up this portal while working in New York, and this little dude came out. And this little guy talked to him and told him that he was uh, from another place, another universe. Uh, he said that he was essentially an extraterrestrial. So this is really the first account of an extraterrestrial, and it was it was done by Aleister Crowley after he said he opened a portal using magic. And remember, this was done back in I believe it was in the twenties, but I could be mistaken. I think that it was done in the twenties. And so, really, this was like the first report of oops. This was like the first uh, report of anything like a, an alien ever, ever. And so after this report. Every other alien report looks just like this one. Everyone basically says an alien looks just like this. So that's really intriguing to me. Uh, it makes you wonder, did he open up a portal? I have no idea. But he definitely did something uh, to be able to make contact with this little critter. And he definitely influenced a lot of people by opening up this portal and letting this thing out. Um, I feel like, I really feel like this is the, the real first depiction of an alien. Uh, that's what I think, but I, I, it's hard to say. I mean, yeah, you can hear my voice, like I'm so hesitant. I don't want to believe in portals. I don't want to believe in all this weird stuff. And so uh, Alistair Crowley also did something that, that I think is intriguing. He lived on the Loch Ness, and he did all these weird, like, magical things at the Loch Ness. And he says that he opened a portal and let the... Uh, Loch Ness Monster out. That's another one I just don't want to believe in. But uh, again, you have to look at the evidence and, and, and decide for yourself, if, oops, decide for yourself that if that really happened. And uh, I think that, I think that's one I'm not too sure about. Uh, I don't know, but I really believe this whole lamb thing and I believe that uh, there is a connection between this and the Betty and Barney Hill abduction. So, uh, 
Yeah, like I said, not too far from uh, the Betty and Barney Hill abduction is this this mountain called uh, Mount Shaw. You know, at the top of Mount Shaw is another one of these tables. And so uh, people think that Alistair Crowley and H.P. Lovecraft got together and did some weird stuff up there. And so if that's true, that means there's a tie between H.P. Lovecraft, Crowley, and aliens again, which that is just weird. So um, we've been looking into that and trying to find out if Crowley and H.P. Lovecraft actually did do these things. And it appears as though they may have. We found proof that Crowley and H.P. Lovecraft had um, had some meetings, and it was because of H.P. Uh, I'm sorry, it was because of H.P. Lovecraft's wife. She went and watched Crowley at a convention, a lot like this, and they ended up hooking up afterwards, changed phone numbers or whatever they did back then, and so uh, they ended up staying in touch. And we do know that. We do know that they both came to New England about the same time. We've been able to prove that. But we have not been able to absolutely prove that they did this magical stuff at the top of Mount Shaw. So that's where I'm at now. I've been working pretty cre pretty hard for the past year on this research. This is what I do. This is literally all I do. I, I research uh, this connection because I, I think it's intriguing and I want to know. I want to know. Are portals real? Are portals something that the paranormal world uses to connect with the afterlife. You know, I'm dying to know if that's true. Well, if I were, I'd probably like use a portal, right? But anyway, um, I, I'd love to know. I, and I'm working really hard to find out. So I'd like to talk to you guys about what you've experienced and if any of you believe in portals and what you think they are, because I think that's important. I think it's important to try to learn from everyone what these things are and what you believe they are. So I'd like to know if any of you have had any experience with this or even anything else, you know? It has to be something that is factual, something we can reproduce, uh, or it isn't a fact. If you can't reproduce something in science, it just doesn't exist. It's not even worth trying. So the, the key is being able to reproduce these portals and try to figure out what they're for and uh, understand how to manipulate them and create them. And that's what we're doing. Uh, people that way smarter than I am are doing this in the lab, but they are really creating these things. I'm excited to see what happens at the end of their experiments to find out if this is legit, if portals are real, because I don't believe in it. You know, I just don't. Yes, sir? No, I know it's just a movie, but how about like the movie Stargate? <laughs> Man, wouldn't that be cool to have a Stargate? <laughs> like, that would be awesome. Uh, it, what, are you, what are you asking about it? But wouldn't that basically be a porthole? Yeah, definitely. They, they considered that a portal, and it was almost a machine that created a portal. So uh, we are actually doing that. Uh, it's not on the scale of Stargate. We don't know where we would send somebody if we did show them through a portal. But uh, yeah, you know, who knows? Someday we may be able to do that. There may be a Stargate. You know, somebody talked the other day about a meteor hitting, and uh, that was interesting to me because I never really thought about that. So uh, meteors are pretty much always magnetic. I mean, you, you know, as a little kid, he used to run a magnet over the ground in order to pick up meteor dust, and I just thought that was the coolest thing. So if you can imagine a gigantic meteor the size of the one that hit Russia back in the day, it may have actually been large enough to do something strange, because now we're using magnetic energy to create portals. So what if this thing would have enough energy to do that? What would it let in? And did it let anything in? You were talking about, and you showed the image of the um, magnetic portal that they've already made. Correct. Now, the human eye, I'm assuming, it, is it little or is it big? It's tiny. It's tiny. When they put something into it, do they see it come out the other end? There's not enough, um, they haven't been able to create it with enough energy that you, they can put anything in there. Like right now, it's just about creating it and being able to reproduce it each time. And so they've done that. And they were, they're trying to make it to where, uh, again, like I said, they just made it invisible and they worked for a whole year to make this thing invisible and now they've done that. So that's kind of crazy. When it is visible, what does it look like? Uh, like a little tornado. Okay. And also, to the, to the naked eye, it's little, but on a measurement scale, is it gigantic? No, it's, no, not, it's, it's not full of mass. Yeah, because like I think what you're asking me is, is it have density, like extreme dis density. No, it does not. Um, it's it's really just two magnets that uh, are connected through 
um, something they don't understand. You know, so like normally a magnet will be connected north and south pole and you can just physically see the magnetic field, but now the magnetic field is like two tornadoes going together. And so that is truly a wormhole, but it's a magnetic wormhole. And that wormhole very well could lead into other dimensions. Yeah, so I've been working really, uh, really hard to understand portals also because I've been doing a lot of paranormal investigations. And so when you go to a paranormal investigation, they're always like, yeah, there's a portal over here. I'm like, well, all right, let's, let's map this thing out. Let me get some like magnet stuff out here. Let me get a freaking like compass. Let me do something that can pick up magnetic fields so I can understand if this is a magnetic portal or, uh, you know, a gravitational portal or what. So I've been working pretty hard on trying to understand portals because I want to understand the paranormal and how they're able to connect with the afterlife. Because <coughs> there has to be a scientific explanation for it. There has to be science behind people who connect with the afterlife. There has to be. And, and you know, what was really interesting is there's this theory floating around. I believe it was Einstein that did this. He said there was no past or future. There was only now. And our brains can only understand it in a linear fashion. And so that's why we see things the way we do. But if you kind of think about that, that means like this room is really crowded right now. This room is like packed full of a lot of people from, you know, the beginning of time. And so it kind of makes you think you're like, you know, maybe bumping into people and stuff all the time. That'd be really weird. But anyway, uh, that's an interesting theory that we're all living in the same moment at the same time. And so if that is true, that would kind of also explanate or uh, give an explanation to like the, some of the paranormal experiences that people have, even the Mothman. You know, like all of this could be explained by that theory, and I think that's really interesting too. And so when I meet people that are really into Crowley and what he did, and then I mean, I've met people that are like super fans of Crowley, man. I'm talking like they got tattoos of Crowley all over the place. And so like these people are really into it and they really do these incantations like on a daily basis. And they're telling me that they have power and they're able to like almost manipulate other people. And you know, there's these stories of Crowley, like uh, one of them uh, was, uh, Crowley was walking down the road with a reporter. And so uh, this reporter is like, hey, do you really have some kind of power? And Crowley's like, yeah, watch this dude in front of me. And so, you know, they're walking down the street and then uh, Crowley eventually just drops to his knees and the dude in front of him dropped to his knees. So he was able to like create some kind of weird mind control as they were walking down the road talking to this reporter. Dude, Crowley just drops to his knees and this other guy does just out of the blue. So like, there's something to what Alistair Crowley was doing. I don't exactly understand it, and I'm telling you, I'm really researching hard to try to figure it out and find out if this magic stuff is real, and it, it truly is legit. Because everything that I've learned over the past year, it's legit, and it's scary. It's freaking terrifying, you know? I'm gonna try to give somebody else a chance. Anybody else wanna ask a question? Anything, what, you got any questions about Crowley, black magic, anything weird like that? Even the Mothman, Bigfoot, I don't care. I've hunted it all. Like, I can probably answer any question you got. Yes, ma'am. I remember somebody talking about how Bigfoot being telepathic. Yeah. Um, and he said that he was in the Bigfoot and Bigfoot. Well, yeah, there, there could be. So, um, Bigfoot. I believe is a Neanderthal, and I base that thought on uh, really uh, science. And and if you look at the if you look at our records, so basically the Neanderthal is the closest thing to us, and uh, they think that the ne Neanderthal had a larger pineal gland. I think that's how you pronounce it. And so that is the gland that allows us to have what people say ESP. And so I kind of like try to describe it like. You know, you walk into a room, you get a certain vibe in the room, or somebody looks at you like, you know they're freaking out. You know they're like mad or something, you know. But you can feel that between other people. And I believe that uh, Bigfoot probably would have that, that sense, that, that, that ability to, to sense what other people are thinking or feeling. So I don't know if that's really ESP or not. I think it's something that every one of us in here have. And I think that if uh, Bigfoot is real, he's probably a Neanderthal, and he's probably learned how to do that because in order for people to hunt a long time ago, they literally, even when I was in the army, we learned how to like communicate just by looking at people. And you can do that. I mean, it's not really that hard. So I think that if Bigfoot is real, he probably would use that, but I don't know if it's true ESP. I think it's just uh, something we all have and just the ability to read people. So I, you know, I don't know if that answers you, but made a pretty solid effort. <laughs> <laughs>
So, uh, any other questions real quick? So, uh, yeah. Then it's legit. You know, a lot of people shy away from all this stuff because it's scary. You know, it, it, they, people believe that like Crowley was like a Satan worshiper. That dude wasn't a Satan worshiper, man. Like, yeah, he, he, he didn't do that. He wasn't out there trying to like wreak havoc, really. I mean, he did some weird stuff, but like he wasn't, you know, he wasn't evil. But um, yeah, so I would love to be able to. Uh, God, it's so scary just thinking about it. It's freaking me out thinking about it. I'd like to sit in on one of these things and see if like it can happen and if they can reproduce it because then that scientific method, then it has been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that this stuff's real. It's a fact that NASA has watched energy you know, energy move out of these dimensional portals. It's a fact. You can just look that up right on NASA.com. So, like, the question is, what is the Aurora Borealis? I've been looking into this lately. So, the Aurora Borealis is uh, energy. It's, it's magnetic fields crossing, which is what we require for a portal. So, we also know that energy moves in and out of these portals. What if the Aurora Borealis was really the crossover point between life and death? I think that's something that no one's really looked at. And I think it's something that's very feasible. And even if it's not over life and death, it could be just simple crossing over to the other side. I mean, it, it, it legit is all of the, the pieces that it takes to create one of these portals is what the Aurora Borealis is. As crazy as it sounds, it's a fact. Do you know, have they re recreated the Aurora Borealis in the lab? I don't think they have. I don't think we really need to because it's there every day. So uh, I think that it, you know it's it's pretty pretty much just there. So uh, so I, I don't think they they tried to recreate it in the lab, but I, I do think there is a possibility that that could be what we're experiencing. Uh, not to say that's what the glow is, but that could be what's going on. And so if that's true, which all this stuff's based on science, that energy may not be there to grab. It may be something a little bit different. All right. So I got a couple more minutes. Anybody else? Going once, going twice, no sale. All right, well, thank you guys. I appreciate you hanging out with me. Hope you see you next week. If you guys like to get a hold of me and see what I'm doing, look up Rogue Mysteries or look up my page on Facebook. My name is Bill Brock. Definitely look me up, add me as a friend, and uh, you can follow what I'm doing. I, I wanted to get more into like the whole black magic thing, but. Uh, being down here they don't really like me to talk about that all that much so like I had to be careful what I talked about is so uh, that's why I had to kind of like be careful about what I said because I, I want to uh, I want to know what you thought of uh, like John Keel's ideas of ultra-terrestrials and that sort of stuff window areas I think that uh, John Keel may have been on something when he started talking about uh, this weird balls of energy that he would see and he like used to use his flashlight to kind of chase him around and stuff yeah. uh, we've experienced that same kind of thing in the team Area. But he flashed to send Morse code and they like would go down. That's yeah. what he says. Yeah, so I, I've kind of experienced the same kind of stuff in the, in the same areas. So uh, I don't know if that's interdimensional or, or has anything to do with portals, but I do know it's real. I do know that stuff's happening for sure. Okay, um, you did a talk last year where you said at the panel discussion, you said that if you went inside the TNT area and you like had a stopwatch or something, you could have like a dilution of time. Yes. We actually went down there with a stopwatch. I don't think we got that much of a difference though in our perception. Um, what we found is just about every minute that goes by there's about a 15 to 20 second change. So like it's not massive yeah. but it's enough of a time perception thing to where you can reproduce it. So like it's not you're not gonna think that you're in there for five minutes or anything you know it's, it's more of just a, a weird feeling like it, it, it it definitely is always off like 15 to 30 seconds like a, yeah. sure. we thought it might yes, just be yes. like uh, anxiety like when you're in there it's, it's scary and you sort of like perceive time so different when you're feel. afraid yeah um i don't know if that's it or not like i mean i'm just being honest like i, okay. I don't know all i know is it happens and i don't yeah. know if it's a perception thing or if it's something else mm -hmm. but uh, i'm sure that it happens i, I think
like last night we were in them in the dark for the first time and um, I, I think it's like a really weird feeling when you're in the very center of it. That's the, the center of it's way different than it is being on like the perimeter of it. Yeah, that's where we would stand when we had these weird time experiments. It's very, absolutely very in the very center um, because there's like a hole that they filled in the center of all the uh, igloos. And so we stand in the, the center of that circle which is where all the weird acoustics happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we even, we also played some music in it in the center to see what the acoustics are like. Yeah. Sounds fun. It sounds really weird. Yeah, yeah. it does. But it, it was like a, it was a really strange experience just seeing it in the middle. We also tried it without the lights and yeah. just play around in them. Yeah, it's fun just to play around and see what you can do in there. Yeah. Okay, another thing, um, you were talking about how on your footage you were showing how like um, audio equipment would mess up and stuff. And John Kill noticed that happened like with everything, with not just like ghosts, but monsters, UFO sort of things. The electricity always messes up. So do you think that if it was a, like anything, it would be like the electromagnetic fields of something? Like yeah, that's that's where I've been messing uh, with it. Yeah, that's that's kind of my thought. Is it some type of magnetic field? Uh, that's the best explanation I have because yeah, I've experienced there, the same kind of thing. There's like that univer like a universal. Uh, like a universal attribute of all these different sightings is that it messes with electricity, like a radio static, TV static, like with the Mothman, uh, Merle Partridge, the CD was messing up, and like um, the police said their radios were messing up during the Scarborough Mouse sighting. So it seems like always they're talking about that happening. Do you think that was electromagnetic fields? Yeah, absolutely. And also the ghost hunters, they go in there with like looking yeah, for electromagnetic fields, yeah. yeah. And when they find it, they say, okay, we have a ghost. So they'll be like made of it or like it just an indication that it's there they uh, people I don't I, I don't have that answer yeah, but I, I can know. tell you what I've been told because I, I ask these same questions to people mm -hmm. and so uh, people think that these ley lines have something to do with the magnetic field and these entities may be using those ley lines to find magnetic fields somehow or, or use them in some way and people have been telling me that so uh, I don't know the answers to a lot of questions because I'm just a researcher just like probably like you are like I'm asking questions trying to learn trying to figure this stuff out and, uh, I've been lucky enough to where I can do it full time I don't have a real job so I just do this all the time so, uh, so I, I guess I kind of might know more than most but I'm just out there asking questions like yeah. you another thing that I wanted to kind of point out to you because John Keel's really good at um, discovering trends among narrative structures and these sightings. So he pointed out how, like, all across the board of paranormal, there's always a glowing, like it glows or it vibrates. So that's another thing, where you're talking about the Aurora Borealis, how it glows. So that's another thing, it could be electromagnetic, making these things glow, like ghosts glow, aliens glow, uh, monsters glow, like all of these things glow. With electro electromagnetic fields, absolutely. I mean, that's, again, that's science, man. Like for that reason, the, the Mothman's eyes glow. Right. Could be. Field. I mean, that, that makes sense. Also, the ultraviolet thing, like the eye burn that happens a lot of times. You heard about that? Yeah. Definitely. That's like ultraviolet rays. Um, John Kay was talking about it going through like a color, like a color spectrum and changing frequencies from uh, infrared to ultraviolet. Like um, it goes through the entire color spectrum from color we can't see to color we can see. Yeah, what, do you, yeah. what do you think about that? Like, does that be why these things uh, come out of nothing and then disappear again? Let well, it go through um, a color I, I kind of talked about that a little while ago, where uh, there's these theories about not being a past or a future, and we all live in the present. Like everything is now. So if that's true, that could explain why we're having these things pop in and out when we see them. And, and maybe it's not a different light, but rather than you know, just you can't see them. And I, I really don't have a solid answer for that because honestly, I'm trying to figure it out. But these are the things that I, I see happening, and uh, yeah. Okay, one more question then. Um, when John Keel's talking about these things, he puts them all uh, <laughs> under the category ultra-terrestrial, like they're, they're all the same thing, they all come from another dimension. Do you think there there is a difference between like uh, ghost reports, monster reports, and UFO kind of reports? Um, I like to believe that Bigfoot is a flesh and blood creature. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that uh, a lot of these other ones are not. And so it really just depends on which critter you're talking about. Uh, I believe that uh, there are some that could be interdimensional because uh, obviously there is other dimensions out there and they're really starting to prove that through science. Yeah. And so uh, it's definitely possible they could be interdimensional like the Mothman or even ghosts or whatever. But uh, yeah.